I'm Chris Titus, and I use Windows, Linux, and Mac on a daily basis. Now, Linus has released his Linux part three, and basically he took on 12 tasks. I absolutely love this part. I did not react to the part two, at least not on the main channel here, uh, just because I did not like part two. But part three, it really explained and showed all the different things and different tasks and what that looks like in Linux, but I wanna expand on it today. We're gonna to take each 12 of these tasks, show you how Luke Linus did it, and then how I do it, because a lot of these tasks I do do differently, and also kinda of add a couple caveats to some stuff they showed, as uh, sometimes it's not as easy as it was for them. So this is actually kind of the reverse of what some people say. And with that, let's get on the desktop and get right into it. First up is cutting and pasting a file. This was really easy for all of them. They just pulled up their file manager. They were using Dolphin for a lot of the copy and paste, but uh, for me, a lot of times I'm using Thunar, which I like a little bit better than Dolphin. They had a lot of criticism of Dolphin, and Dolphin, even for a veteran, I think uh, you can utilize some of the good features in it, uh, but for a noob, I really don't like Dolphin. Uh, personally, I really love Thunar. It's a good balance of noob friendly, but also has a lot of really cool tools such as like uh, copy and pasting a file. Again, you could just right click it, copy it, and then go into wherever you're going and paste that file right in like that. But you could also do it uh, from terminal. So they did not show it this way as a Linux, you know, a lot of times we need to do things from kernel, uh, terminal. So let's uh, just copy trying to do simple tasks and we were gonna put that in the games directory. And that just kind of takes it and puts it in games like that. So that was a copy paste, uh, or just a copy. Uh, but if you wanted to do like cut and paste, you could use MV to move or CP to copy. So MV is moving and copy is this. Also, if you're interested in the terminal, remember dash dash help or man, uh, which is manual and then like copy command. And it kind of gives you an even greater exp explanation of what's going on. So it's really, really cool. Love these copy paste. Uh, can't really go wrong with it. Next up was digitally signing. Luke did it this way, which I thought was extremely interesting. And frankly, I'm gonna actually probably use this program in the future in Linux. And then Linus kind of fumbled around a little bit with his uh, doing it because I think he was trying to do it the proper way. Luke really just kind of copy and pasted an image into a PDF document. And that's not really digitally signing uh, if you were like submitting it to like a courts or something like that. But for most instances, for most documents, people don't care about the digital signature. And there you go. You, you can do it the copy paste way like Luke did. But for Linus, I can appreciate uh, he ran out of time. And, and frankly, it's a difficult thing when you get into digital signing on Windows or even Mac. I mean, all of them are kind of difficult to do. Me personally, I'm just going to say I don't really use Linux and PDFs. Uh, PDF was actually created by Adobe. So what I do is I usually boot into a Windows or Mac instance launch Adobe Reader, and then just simply use it in those environments. Uh, sad to say, PDFs, uh, sometimes I, I found, just don't react that well to some of the more obscure stuff like Adobe portfolios. Digital signatures can be a little bit troublesome. And this is just kind of uh, how I do it. But it was cool to see Luke do it that way. Now for sp uh, Excel spreadsheets, this was actually pretty easy for both Linus and Luke. I'm not even gonna play the clip, mainly because they had an image just directly in here and all they did was just right click it and then export it directly. Uh, pretty much any editor or office editor in Linux does this. LibreOffice, I'm using only Office here. Uh, you could also use free Office. All these have really good compatibility and I've actually never run into this problem. Uh, anytime I've ever wanted to export an image from an Excel document, uh, again, very simple to do. It's just a right click and export. Now for task four, they actually did some cool stuff uh, with fonts. Now they did it all through there and, and basically the gist of it is you need to extract like a font from like fonts.com or wherever you might get it, open it up and then extract that and then right click and say install with the editor. However, I don't install fonts this way. Both Luke and Linus did it their own way, which I thought was kind of interesting, but also kind of speaks to how good some of the distros they're using are. 
However, again, I don't. I, I'm more of a server admin first, uh, Linux desktop user second. So how I install fonts, usually I extract everything through command line using like a, a tar, but I have all of that in this right here, and I put all everything pretty much in my fonts folder. So anytime I create a new system, I usually just mount this drive here, which we'll get you know, here in a second, and then just copy all the fonts that I like to use. So I would just do a copy of this into basically my home folder dot fonts like this. And once that's copied, I just do FC dash cash dash VF. Uh, for verbose and force. And what this does is it goes through that cache directory, finds all those fonts and loads them automatically. So I just loaded about a hundred fonts in about 30 seconds. It's kind of a cool little way to do it. And now if I launch GIMP and I, I think there was a like a Gotham or Overseer font, uh, we could actually just go into here. Let's say we wanted to type something here and I can just go Linux right here and put that in the forefront so you can see the overseer font in action and I think uh, O's are the ones with like the fallout theme which is kind of cool so anyways uh, that's just font installs which is just a different way of doing it next up is like printing a document now they were printing to um, their own respective printers I actually haven't installed any printer here if I did uh, I haven't had any issues with printing I have a brother I think it's a M277 is a great MFP out there. But one thing they didn't touch on, or I probably would have been a better challenge, although it would have been very difficult for the respective printers, is if they had MFPs, which is multifunction printers, to scan. Sometimes that can be a little bit troublesome in Linux. Uh, for my specific printer, I just hard coded it on that network printer to scan into my network drive on my Synology box back there. So I don't really have any issues with that, but I also just kind of want to say when it comes to scanning and some of the extra tools that some uh, multifunction printers come with, uh, it's a little bit dodgy on the actual support in Linux. However, I've never really had much problems actually getting to just plain printing aspect of Linux, and they didn't either. It was really easy to add all of them, even more so than it is in Windows. So for compressing files, a lot of times you would go into here, select them, and then they would compress them using here. I actually don't have any compression programs installed to do that through the GUI because I don't I don't like it that way. I know I probably should install something, but I just haven't. So how I usually do it is just do um, a VCF, and I usually, like, let's say I want to enable this fonts.tar.xz. Uh, this is just a, a way to zip files in Linux, and then I just want to put all those into that fonts file. So if we just do that do a listing again you can see this right here has my new fonts tar and this is all the fonts that are installed on this system uh, so if i did want to let's say go thunar right here you can see that's my zip file and i could take this put it everywhere the reason why i do terminal one i think it's a little bit faster than trying to select all these although you you know control a right click compress that's pretty easy too but with all the options here i find terminal edges it out a little bit also speed wise i find this to be a little bit superior than the graphic elements because you can get hangs and other things that they kind of talked about in their video when they were doing the compression so this is just a kind of another workaround for those out there trying to compress and send files now, as far as screenshots go, uh, this was kind of cool to see. Uh, Linux does probably the best on screenshots. I love it. Now, on Windows, I like ShareX. It's a fantastic program for use Windows users out there. I even did a video on it. I'll try and link it above. But uh, I would say for this uh, screenshots, I do all hotkey based on my specific like custom built desktop like I have here. I do Windows P to go ahead and take a screenshot of this entire screen like I just did or I do control shift P and then I just select what it is and then I just hit save and it saves my screenshot you might be like where'd that go and I just have a screenshots folder with all kinds of different stuff in here and then I just get it put it and then I'm done so it takes very very few seconds to do all of my screenshots as I use flame shot with custom uh, hotkeys uh, and in Windows, I do the same thing with custom hotkeys, but with ShareX. Very similar. Now, as far as making shortcuts to things, uh, they actually did something I've never seen a Linux user do in, in, a, in a good way. <laughs> so it was actually very good how they made some of the shortcut keys. Like, I think Linus did it this way, which I thought was cool. 
as far as shortcuts go in Linux, for me, a lot of times I do symbolic links to, to let's say, link a directory that makes it a shortcut, or you could do aliases as well. So if we look here, let's say I wanted to make a shortcut for that image file to open up in GIMP per se. So what I could do here is just make an alias of LTT GIMP equals, and then what I do is just say GIMP, and then I just make the home folder, and then put this from downloads into LTT challenge right here, like that. Uh, <laughs> so what this little shortcut does is it makes something to where I can just do LTT GIMP, and then it would open up this thumbnail. Kind of cool, uh, but it's a way to do challenge. And you might be like, well, how do you make that permanent? There's a lot of different ways to do it, but a lot of times people just like to use like bash RC and then put this at the end of the file. And as far as network shares, uh, that was actually pretty easy for them. They just pulled this up and I have a, a lot of network shares in my environment. Actually, most of everything you see here is a network share. This is a network share images, Final Cut Pro, that's dedicated drive on my Synology. All these are actual network shares, but I have them as local pass, which makes this so much easier. But if you wanted to do just like an SMB and then pull up this network share, I could just do something like this and type in my password to log in. I type in my password um, and I'll just do a forward slash. And this kind of connects to my network share and then I can go into images. If I had any, any images I wanted to download, I could grab them from my my NAS box back there. Very simple to do right here. Again, this is not really how I connect to it though. Uh, so you could actually do, uh, put it directly in what's called ETC F-STAB. You could put it in here. You can see I have these kind of commented out as this is one way to do it. I used to do it this way and there's nothing wrong with this way, but I wanted it to be a little bit more controlling of when I connect to it. So I actually took this out. So if you didn't want to do it through FSTAB or through the GUI like Linus and Luke did, you could easily go ahead and do this through a systemd service. So if we actually go to etc systemd-system, we can actually see all these different ones. And what I did is I made little mount services and this mounts them basically after a timeout. And then I have a specific thing that says, hey, I wanna do it after uh, you connect the drive. So I think uh, we have media-drive here. This is more of a, a tried and true SIFS or, or Samba share that they did. And this is me just incorporating it into the core of the system and then having it start up as the system starts up and auto connect to everything. Uh, but those are two different ways to auto connect from command line. You could incorporate it with systemd like right here, or you could also do it through FSTAB. Both ways are great. Or if you want to just connect and make a shortcut in your uh, GUI browser right here, do it there too. There's no wrong way of doing this. All of them are very good. And then probably uh, some of the other things was just like playing 4K files. I thought that was kind of interesting. Everything is easy. Boom. <laughs> There's your 4K file and we can go full screen with it. I think Linus had some issues with full screen and I made a video a while back about this and what it was was basically me calling VLC trash. Uh, it was probably my worst received videos in my channel's history. And what I really should have labeled that is VLC's trash on Linux. <laughs> it's not a best experience. I always say MPV, which I think Linus actually did when he played his back, but I like to use celluloid, which is this. It has a really slick front end it's able to scrub really quickly. And then also on it, you can change a lot of neat little things from pop-ups. Has all this shortcut keys to where it actually kind of walks through all the little different things you can do with that video as it's playing back. So I really like Celluloid. If you're on KDE, you might go with like SM Player, very, very similar to Celluloid. Both of them use MPV, so you can't really go wrong here. And then finally, I'll just show my Discord here. This is kind of a cool little thing. I actually run like a little Minecraft server, minecraft.christitis.com. And this is like my little Discord server I, I throw up and I launch this automatically on startup. I actually do it a different way than probably anybody in the world does it. And if we actually pull this up, I do all my configuration. Again, I don't actually have a desktop environment. This is all custom that I've just kind of built around a window manager. So all my configuration actually happens from uh, the command line, which is a little bit weird, but I'm gonna do a future video of how I set all this up. So if you wanna replicate it, you can. But 
for today, let's just uh, come into our home directory. We're just going to go into BSPWM. That's my window manager. And then it's a launch file. And what it does every time I launch and start my system, it just runs through this file. And there's a lot of different stuff in here. It's a little bit complex. But how I actually auto launch uh, Discord and Synergy and all that other stuff, I actually have a little script with a little ping result here. And what I'm doing is I'm pinging Cloudflare to see, hey, does Cloudflare respond? And if it does, then I launch my Discord into Workspace 6. After that launches, I go to here with a completely fresh uh, environment, which is great. And that's kind of how I manage uh, my auto launches. So I actually auto launch a lot of different things from Synergy to PyCom, which is like my uh, compositor here, uh, but you got Discord and it goes further. And I even do my, like my mount drives here, which is specific to my thing. But I, I do all this again from just a startup script. And, and I like to kind of control where all my windows end up and what workspaces. Oh man, you could just go kind of wild with this. Uh, and I think all of them basically had Discord startup on pretty easily. Now, now, obviously, this is not really the easiest way to start up Discord. For them, it was much easier. It was more of, hey, with Mint, just saying auto start application, uh, like Luke did or, or Linus uh, with his KDE. Both of them have easy startups. So I hope all this was really informative. I really liked part three. Uh, part two kind of got me bummed out. I did not like part two at all, but it was really good to see kind of like a return to form for uh, this challenge. And the thing I love the most is there was a lot of things that were educational in that video. And that's what I always try and do with my videos here. Hopefully you learn something new, see how I do it compared to them. Both ways are, there's nothing wrong with either way they're doing it. Uh, all these ways were good. Everything in that video I actually enjoyed uh, because even I learned a little bit of something because I would never do it that way. But it's not to say it's wrong. It's just a different way of doing things. So it was great. What did you guys think of part three? What did you think of this educational reacts video? And with that, let me know in the comments and I'll see you in the next one.